Okay, I feel better now. There we go. Um, okay, so let me, ah, okay, I don't know, I'm being technology weird. It must be Thursday in week 12, that's what it is. Okay, so, um, so for the farm final, right? So uh, 55 questions, multiple choice, select all that apply. Um, what else can I tell you? Everything, tell us the answers. No. Um, so we have eight questions on the um, maternal newborn meds. And so the ones that uh, are on your list, oxytocin, the methogen, carboprost, mesoprostol, betamethasone, terbutaline, vitamin K, and hepatitis B. Um, basically, again, what you need to know is kind of like the mechanism of action in terms of like, when are you using the medications? So for example, um, if the person is going to be receiving um, oxytocin, then what, um, like, what do you need to tell them? What are they going to expect? Why are they going to be on it? Um, and what are they, what can they ex expect? Um, same thing for terbutaline. What, when do we use terbutaline? Preterm labor. Okay, and why? Why in preterm labor? To slow down the, to slow down the contractions. Yeah, right. Because well, and how does how do we slow down the contractions? Relax the smooth muscle in the yeah. uterus. Mm -hmm. And so um, you need to know the side effects or adverse um, effects of terbutaline. And then. Um, Vitamin K, you guys, you guys will know the answer to that one. Um, hepatitis B, you'll know, like, you know, you just have to know when are you giving the vitamin K? Why are you giving it? Where are you administering it? Um, the hepatitis B, again, I think we did, what did we do on the quiz or something like hepatitis B and the um, immune globulin, that kind of stuff, right? When do you give which one? Like when, so, when do you give the um, the immunoglobulin, the um, Hbig? When you get when mom is negative. Yeah. When no. mom's Rh negative. No. Um, no. Something different. No. Right? Yeah. yeah. Hepatitis. We're talking hepatitis, not rhodium. So, so you give oh, the immuno, immunoglobulin if the mother is positive on the dieter's test on the when when she's pregnant they do a hepatitis B. Lab. Yeah, and if she comes mm -hmm. back positive, then she, the baby's going to need both the vaccine and the immunoglobulin. If she's negative, you just give the vaccine. Correct. Also, if also mom status, status. status. Yes, thank you, Lex. It comes up, Lex. Alexis. <laughs> yeah. What was that? You both said unknown. At the same time. Unknown. If yeah. they're unknown, not just positive, but also if they're unknown. Miss Cylinder, so we know status, like um, the time frame. Mm, I mean, that comes with when you're giving them, right? Oh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, yes. Uh, and then betamethasone, right? So when do we give betamethasone? To mature to mm -hmm. the infant. So if the mom is going to get into pre preterm labor, we want to give two doses of that, right? It takes like, I forgot, 24 or 48 hours to, to work. And it just helps with surfactant uh, mm -hmm. production. Yeah. Did they Did score? Yeah, two long runs. Oh, shit. Wait, who scored what? Hmm? What are we watching? The, giant, the Giants scored, yes, but the Giants are losing right now against the Mets. Oh, I'm so mad. Oh. No, yeah. they have to beat the Mets. I know. Jeez. Sorry. No. <laughs> Got to have some fun in your life. There we go. Okay. I and have then, a question. Yes. Sorry. D Daniel. Um, so with the, it's back to the hep B thing. Um, the mom gets the immunoglo immunoglobulin when the mom is hep B positive. Is that correct? The, ba the baby. We're the talking baby. about. 
We're not talking about mom. We're talking about baby. The baby gets the immunoglobulin globulin, and the vaccine. Mm-hmm. Right. If mom and is then positive also- or unknown status. Or unknown. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then um, for like the, the methogen and the hemabate, um, the cytotec. So you need to know, um, like, what, so what do we use methogen for? To treat postpartum hemorrhage. Mm-hmm. So when, do we, when do we not give methogen? If they have hypertension or high blood pressure. Okay. And then... What do we use? Um, Harborprost, Humabate. When do we use that? Well, it's a second line of treatment. Um, if the patient is, um, if they cannot have methogen, then you go to the Carboprost. But what else, when, when would you not be able to give Carboprost? Oh, if they have asthma history. Asthma. History of asthma. Yeah. Now, one of the things, um, and it's not on the exam, but what I'm seeing a lot of right now that I didn't see last year is using the um, transexamic acid, the TXA. Um, I'm seeing that used a lot, a lot more. Um, that actually crosses over from the surgical arena into the OB arena. Um, and uh, I just thought that was interesting because I hadn't seen it used at all last year. And now like they're, everybody's using it a lot. Um, Sully, what, what is that? that you what is, yeah. So TXA, you can look at it. It's the letter T X a, um, mm-hmm. it's called trans examic acid. Um, you can look it up under TXA. It should pull up under TXA and it's to, um, it's to stop bleeding, but it's more from a, like a surgical nature, not a uterine nature. Right. So when we use methogen, um, it's because the uterus isn't contracting. Right. And we're trying to get the uterus to contract, Mm -hmm. but the TXA doesn't have to do with that. It has another mechanism of action um, where it's more like surgical bleeding, like to start like an anti um, like a coagulant to like like to coagulate the blood to stop the bleeding. It doesn't act on the uterus per se. um, But what they're finding is that in the fact that it helped with the bleeding like of surgeries, right? Surgical bleeding, um, they brought it over into the OB labor, hi, over to the labor um, arena, right? So a lot of times they'll use that. But like I said, it's not on your, it's not on your um, exam, but I just wanted to bring that up as a, oh, look at the little one, hello. And I was saying hi to him. Hey, yo, hi. Um, and so that's, um, it's just an FYI, it's not on the exam, but it's good to know like all the different ones. Um, what do we use mesoprostol for? It's a suppository use, uh, another way to, um, help, uh, efface and dilate the cervix. Right. So when would, when would we need to use that? To induce labor, to induce labor, <laughs> right? And so, what are some things when we're um, when we're going to induce labor? What um, like what are I don't know some safety things or nursing interventions that um, that we should be doing? Consent, maybe. Consent yeah, consent. Part. Maybe, yeah. Fetal heart rate. So fetal heart rate. We're not quite there yet. We're just inducing labor. I mean, yes, we can. But more in terms of the mom, you probably want to do a check, a cervical check mm-hmm. anytime yep. you see because what about if they're already at 10 or something? You know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I hope we would know if they were at 10, but yes, mm-hmm. I hope they would know if they were at 10. But yes, right. If they're dilated, then we don't need to necessarily give any give anything to induce because they're already starting to dilate and efface. What else are we going to want to monitor? Contractions. Um, yeah, but not, not yet. I'm I'm thinking, no, not real. So I'm thinking, let me rephrase the question. We're getting ready to it. So let me, let me try that this again. Hold on. So we're not thinking about the baby yet because we're starting to induce labor. So this is focused on mom. 
Okay. And actually Maria um, had said something about uh, you can give it as a suppository. And so think about some things that you would um, want mom to do if we're giving a suppository. Bed rest. Oh, why? So you can... It'll come out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So those are the things I'm thinking of. Right. What are we going to do for mom if we're going to start inducing labor? Um, and, and you're right. You're going to check dilation because if if she's dilated, we're not going to give it. We're not going to want to have her move because we want it to stay. Those kind of things. Maria, you said bed rest. Rose said a bed rest because it's being that it's a suppository. Um, if she gets up, it can the suppository can come out. Mm hmm. Ms. Thank you. I have a question. How long would you suggest that they stay in bed for? So um, how long maybe does it take for a suppository, regardless of it's where it is inserted? Because you can you have vaginal suppositories and rectal suppositories, by the way. Um, how long do you think? Is it like 30 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah, like 30 to 60 minutes. Exactly. Look at that. Y'all figure that out on your own. Yeah. Thank but you. they don't have to stay in bed for like three to four hours, right? It's it's going to hopefully melt within um, 30 to 60 minutes. So nice. Okay. So I think that covers the maternal newborn meds. Yes. And hopefully y'all are seeing some of that in clinical. So that's helping to, to make sense to you. Yeah. Hopefully. Okay. Yes, no, maybe. I'm seeing a lot of controversy off of that misoprostol right now because it helps to, you know, you know, induce abortions, I guess. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of controversy over that right now. Right. The FDA but that's... like was trying to pull it off the oh, market. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see what you're saying. Yeah. No, we have other options besides that. So, you know, at least there are other options for induction of labor. So mm -hmm. I have a question, Mrs. Uh, what about mag mag sulfate? Are we needing to know about that one? Uh, yes, but not in that category. Okay, in, in another category. Okay. Um. Okay. Hematopoietics and the um antibiotics, right? Um. So basically. There's, let me double check here. Da, da, da. Ba, 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 da, da. Sorry, I'm just like double checking here. Okay, so for, uh, let's see, the EPO, right? It's the, the three categories that we that we talked about, the epoetin alpha, the phil, um, philgrastum, the nupogen, and the, um, oh, I can never say that. I'm just gonna say the interleukin. Um, right. And so you're looking at, um, we're not even looking at fluid stuff. It's, it's more of the, um, the, um, the epoetin, that kind of stuff. So what do we use epoetin alpha for? What does that help with? Increased production of erythrocytes. Oh, and what's the other name for erythrocytes? Red blood cells. Red blood cells. Red blood cells. Yeah. And so if you're giving that, then, um, you need to know, uh, like side effects, adverse effects of that. And then, um, doo -doo -doo. and then how do you know, excuse me, that the medication's being effective? Check the hemoglobin. Excuse me. Um, that was a rhetorical question, but if, yeah, you want to, right? You're going to check. Yeah, because you want to, if you're hopefully we're making more red blood cells, right? That's what we, that's what we want to be doing, right? Um, and then for the, da, 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 I did that one. Um, and so again, for um, like the philgrastum and the um, interleukin, you know, why are we using it? What do they help, help do? What are, what are we trying to, to fix? Right. So you need to know like indications. There we go. That's the word for it. Indications. Why are we giving it? Um, and then um, 
side effects and adverse reactions. So basically for those three, why are we giving them? How do we know they're effective? And what are side effects and adverse effects of those? And then for, um, oops. Do, do, do. For Vanco, um, right? Because we're doing Vanco and Gents, right? So Vanco, it's not on red man syndrome. Just saying, <laughs> you won't have to know that. You got tested on that already, right? So uh, for Vancomycin, what are things that you need to know or check prior to giving Vancomycin? Peak and trough levels. Yeah, you peak and trough. The peak and trough levels. There we go. BUN um, and creatinine. Uh, mm -hmm. like a kidney function okay am uh, i missing a quote where did it go hold on one second um right and then so like um gentamicin uh um Sorry, bear with me for one moment here. Um, there it is. Um, and then when you're doing, when you're administering um, gentamicin um, or aminoglycosides, right? That's amin aminoglycoside. Um, what lab value should you be monitoring? And, um, and these are rhetorical, unless I ask you uh, specifically. Um, and then if you are, um, if you're gonna give uh, gentamicin um, and you need to know what other antibiotics you might give if the person has gram positive cocci versus if they have gram, gram negative. So like if you had to give it in with something else, what would you, um, what like classification would you give it with? That sounds more difficult than it really is because if you think about it, we give certain combinations of, of antibiotics, especially in neonates. We give gentamicin with another type of um, classification of antibiotics. So if you think about it in those terms, that will help you. Because we've talked about that. I know we've talked about that in lecture. You okay. said, um, sorry. Yep. You yep. said, like you're asking, what other med would you give it with if the bacteria was Gram positive. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. And then, so that takes care of that. Okay. Then moving on to endocrine, three questions on endocrine. So, um, of course, our levothyroxine, right, which is Synthroid. And so, um, what do you need to know about, what do you need to know about Synthroid, levothyroxine, right? Why are we giving it? Um, how long do we give it? Um, uh, the, the best ways to, um, to take it like either time of day, or like, do you take it with food, without food, um, for the, um, the PTU, the propylthiouracil, again, what, how does it work? What's its mechanism of action? And then for the, um, prop I'm sorry, the methimazole, the tapazole, um, you know, you're doing, um, hold on. Uh, like, why are they taking it? Why is it prescribed? Um, like the side effects, kind of like patient education, right? So like what side effects should they expect? When should they take it? How should they take it? Why are they taking it? And then GI is three meds, the anti-ulcer type medication. So you've got um, omeprazole, um, famotidine, and the calcium carbonate, the Tums. Um, and so basically, um, you said Oma. Omeprazole. It's on your, yeah, it's on your, it's on your focus areas. Thank you. Right. So if you guys are going down your focus areas, you could take notes on those as well. Um, oops, just lost my train of thought there. So um, uh, for antacids, for the calcium carbonate, like 
how are you going to take it? You can take it with food, without food. What do you need to be careful about? Um, like what is an antacid doing? So when would you have to, um, how would you take it? Um, okay. And then our um, H2 receptor agonists, antagonists, sorry, 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 antagonists. H2 receptor antagonist. Um, again, why are we giving it? How do we know it's been effective? If it's, what do, what do we use? Um, why do we use, uh, this is a question now, why do we use H2 receptor antagonists? What are they, what are they supposed to relieve? Reduce GI secretion? Um, Yeah, I mean, and so what's what are like um, what are symptoms of that? I guess would be my question. Like a heartburn and GERD. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. okay. And then um, protein pump inhibitors, right? Um, so again, why do we give it, and how do we know it's working? Okay, week five, nothing, yay, week six. Okay, seven questions on week six, which is the um, perioperative meds. You have your list here of which ones you need to know, um, which that matches with like the locals, epidural, spinals. So uh, let's see, what do we have? Ketamine, um, when do you, when, when is ketamine a good choice or are there any types of patients um, where you wouldn't want to give ketamine as an anesthetic agent? That's a question to you all. Um, I mean, I know ketamine's a highly addictive drug, so maybe to people who have problems with that, that would be an option. That would be one option. Uh -huh. How, what, what effects does it have on the client, potentially? Hallucinations, or is that a one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, who's... You don't want to give huh? to pregnant clients. You don't give to no. pregnant clients. No, you wouldn't want to give to pregnant clients. <laughs> is there any other type of clients? Peptic ulcer. Dementia. Oh, dementia is the right road. Yeah. Dementia. Turn around. Uh, bipolar disorders. Uh huh. And what do those all fall under? Mental what category. Health. Mental health type, right? Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Um. Okay, so um, when you are looking at, um, nope, I take that back. Um, oops, sometimes I just scroll too fast. Okay, so what? Um, when would when would we give um, lidocaine? What's lidocaine good for? Just a lo local anesthetic. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, no, that works. Now understand that local anesthetic doesn't just mean topical, right? It can be local anesthetic, um, like, in, like oral mucosa, stuff like that. Oh, our friend Versed, there we go. Um, why do we give Versed as anesthesia? It's conscious, oh. conscious anesthetic, uh, right? Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, but what was one of the big concepts about anesthesia that you guys uh, talked about in your case study? Malignant hypothermia. 
know. Yeah, that was one, but that's with that would be uh, a different medication. It was another big thing we talked about. You mean like talk a about combined it. sedation? Yeah. Yeah. What do you call that? Uh, balance anesthetics. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's when you're giving an anesthetic and then you're giving something um, like a sedative hypnotic in conjunction with, right? So that you don't have to use as much of the other anesthesia. Right. Rem remember that? No. It's okay. <laughs> And then malignant th hyper, uh, hyperthermia, right? And so, um, what do you? What's that used for? What, or what do you? What is going to help with that? Help turn that around? Is that a question? Yes. Okay. Dantrolene. Yeah, dantrolene. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else did we have? So, okay. Propofol somewhere, maybe. Oh, propofol. There we go. I could do it like the Jeopardy question. Which famous musician died from an overdose of propofol? Um, Michael Jackson. Jackson. There you go. <laughs> Except he didn't overdose himself, but that's okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, like, the medications that you would use for... Um, uh, do, 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 do. sorry for like conscious sedation options for conscious sedation. I think you said like ketamine. I think Maria already said ketamine, um, propofol, that kind of stuff. Um, we talked about dantrolene and then we need pancuronium. What is pan question? Uh, what is pancuronium used for? What kind of medication is that? Doesn't it paralyze the lungs or something like that? Mm -hmm. It's a paralytic, right? And why do we use paralytics? To intubate? Yeah, to intubate. Um, or if they are intubated and we don't want them to pull tubes out. Um, but uh, in terms of like surgical, yeah, to, to intubate. Because um, what's the action of it? What's its action of, of pancuronium? Um, it blocks the transmission of uh, acetylcholine. Uh, okay. This causes paralysis in the skeletal muscles. Yeah. So put put that. Explain that to me like I'm six years old. So um, that means that your um, your skeletal muscles will be um. Um, I don't know how to say it's a six-year-old <laughs> other than paralyzed. <laughs> What's another word for paralyzed? They can't move. Cannot move. Yeah. <laughs> but but it stops your lungs from not breathing. But it's not lungs. Oh. It's not just it's not lungs. It's like it's but you just said. Like it, yeah, it's the, so whole, the whole upper respiratory. Yeah, we talked about so hold on. We already established that it's muscle. Maria already told us muscle, right? And we're saying that it paralyzes. And so paralyzes, it, when we think of paralyzed, we think, oh my gosh, they're like not moving, right? But it's really more of a muscle relaxation to the point that it's not moving, the muscle's not moving, right? So it's more like a skeletal muscle relaxation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Because if we relax the skeletal muscle, then we can intubate because they're not, their gag reflex isn't there. Right. And so it makes it easier to, right, to intubate or do things like that to prepare for surgery. Okay. So is, is the word that you were looking for relax? Mm hmm. Okay. That's the word I was looking for. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on, I'm just double checking something here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so on your, um, 
one, two, three, four, five. So take pentothal off of your, um, off of the question distribution. In week six, pentothal, second from the bottom, cross that one out. Oh man, but I did that flashcard already, darn it. Nope, <laughs> do that one, nope. yeah. Didn't do that one. There we go. Saved you Didn't one. Didn't do that one. Yeah. I okay. Rip. I'll just rip it now. It's okay. <laughs> rip it good. There we go. Okay. Anti-inflammatories. Three questions. Right. Prednisone, ketorolac, and celecox celecoxib. Right. So prednisone. Would you, would you need to know about prednisone? Right. Why do we use it? What does it do? And if they're going to stop taking it, what's the best way to stop taking it? Um, what's the other name for Ketorolac? Tordal. Tordal. Anybody given Tordal or seen Tordal given? Yeah. 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 And how do we, how is it generally, how do we administer it? IV push. IV, IV push. push. Mm -hmm. But what, what classification is it? I'm sorry. NSAID. It's an NSAID. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, and so that's why we want to, um, oh, there we go. I couldn't read my writing. Oh my gosh. Right. And so that's what we're, we're going to do the tort all. And I think it actually, I know in Nativitat, I think we give four doses. And then after the four doses, they go to POs. You can still take the, the scheduled POs, but you can only give the, the um, Toradol four times. That's their um, protocol. I don't know what it is at um, SV, SVH. And, and that's um, because of kidney problems, right? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so what do you know, um, like uh, for, I'm sorry, I'm gonna rescind that, not a question. For celecoxib, um, also known as Celebrex, right? What? Why are we giving it? Um, and why is it? Why is it helpful? Um, right? Was that three? That was three, right? Prednisone, celecoxib, and Portal. Yay! You guys got this. This is good. Okay. Anything too overwhelming yet? No. Maybe. No. Keep going, Mrs. Sonder. Okay, I'm going. Okay. <laughs> Week seven, week eight, nothing, right? Because we didn't have anything. Okay, then our week nine is our um, anticoags, our coagulation modifiers, right? And so um, what do we have? Clopidogrel, TPA or Altaplace, the Warfarin, Anoxaparin, and then you've got the, um, the Pradaxa and Xarelto, right? The Dabigantrin and the Rivoxabarin, which are the, um, the NOACs, the novel oral anticoagulants. Um, and then to know the antidotes, right? The protamine sulfate for heparin and the vitamin K for um, warfarin. And so um, you would need to know um, side effects of, um, hold on, let me go back here. Let's start with the um, river oxaban and the um, dabigat, I can never say those, dabigatrin. Um, so, why are we using them as opposed to other anticoags? What are like the reasons why we might use those? And then also what are the side effects? If we're doing client teaching, what are we going to include um, in the teaching, especially in terms of, um, because it's an anticoagulant. Um, and let me find, uh, nope. Wrong one. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. And then, um, oh yeah, I already asked you that one. So why, yeah, why would you give? Why might somebody give um, one of the NOACs as opposed to like warfarin? Um, and also, if you're going to be going from, um, if you're going to go from like warfarin or heparin to a, a, a NOAC, like how does that happen? What, um, what's the time frame for that? If you're switching from one to the other, like, is there a time frame? How long do you take one? So you have to continue on like the heparin as you transition into warfarin for, is it a week? 
Um, about I think yes. So let's see. Uh, Yeah, let me get to one other question and we'll come back and it'll make sense. Um, bear with me for one minute there. So when we're taking warfarin, so you don't have to know the PT or PTT, but you need to know what a normal um, INR, the international normalized ratio is. Okay, and is that is that INR for warfarin coumadin or is that for heparin? Coumadin. So yes, so the INR, because INR goes with PT, which is the warfarin coumadin, right? And so if the, um, what do we want the INR to be? What range do we want it to be in? Two to three. Two to three, right? And so if it is um, higher than that, then that means that, um, what does that mean? If the you INR want to is call the doctor, you want to right. call the doctor oh. so they can hold the warfarin, right? High risk for bleeding. Blood is too thin. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so if it's um, if the INR is you want it between two and three. So if it's higher than that. Um, what would you want to give? Vitamin K. There you go. So then if we talk about switching from warfarin to say dabigatrin, when would be a good time, not looking at how many days, but looking at where do I want my labs to be? Where do I want my INR? if I'm going to be switching over. I confused you. Where do Thank I want my, huh? Uh, I was thinking maybe we want it to be in that normal range between. Yes. Two and three. Why? Because if it's higher than it's too, uh, blood is thin and uh, there is a higher chance of bleeding or bleeding out. And if it's normal range, that means the medication hasn't hit that hard and means we and so it's okay, it, right? It's, it's okay to switch. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Whew. Good thinking. We got it. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Okay. Uh, we got that one. We got that one. And then, what do you need to know about um, Plavix? What what is what is Plavix's? What does it do? What type of medication is it? Sorry, classification. It's an antiplatelet. Mm hmm. And so what other medication might you give it with? Might, might you see it prescribed with? Aspirin. Ooh, why? Rose, you are on it tonight. <laughs> Coagulant. <laughs> right, because we're going to try and keep them the same types together, right? Um, and so... Um, when might you not want to give um, Plavix or clopidogrel, clopidogrel? When might it be contraindicated? Is a question. Uh, GI bleeds or mm -hmm. any other type of bleed? Or yeah, or anything that, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Anything, yeah, any kind of bleed any or anything associated with with bleeding or potential bleeding. So you guys are gonna be fine. <laughs> I have the utmost faith. Okay, week 11, right? Week 11, week 10, nothing, week 11. Okay, so those are the immunomodulators. And what did I tell you? I told you what, three questions? And so then you've got, let's see. <laughs> so why do we give, um, why do we give infliximab, Remicade? What does that do or prevent?
Let me try what, again. What meds? Hold on. Infliximab, Remicade. I'm looking on the, the question distribution on week 11. The second one down is Remicade or Infliximab. Just by the name, what type of medication is it? Infliximab. If it's an MAB ending. Mono, uh, monoclonal uh -huh. antibody. Right. And what do monoclonal, how do they work? It blocks the activity of tumor like, um, or the TNF, which is the tumor well, necrosis factor. Yeah, except that monoclonal, it depends on which monoclonal ad an antibody it is. Monoclonal antibodies have specific targets and it, they may or may not be um, tumors, but they're specific for something. So a lot of them are anti-inflammatories. They're not, they're monoclonal antibodies, but they're specific to like the, um, the DMARDs, the, the, anti the rheumatoid arthritis drugs, the anti-rheumatoid arthritis drugs. So right. it and blocks, uh, blocks inflammation or reduces depending, inflammation? Depending on what it's for. Okay. That's the kind of cool thing about monoclonal antibodies is that they, they can target a lot of different things. Not like, like each, it's a one-to-one -one kind of thing. Each medication can target a specific, has a specific target for what it's going to affect. Um, and so Remicade specifically would be for um, inflammation, like an ant as an anti-inflammatory. Um, just trying to think another way to explain this. So if it's an anti-inflammatory, let me come back to that one, see if I can fix that one. Um, so methotrexate, that's another one, right? That's an anti-inflammatory. It's for rheumatoid arthritis, right? And yeah. so um, uh, patient teaching in terms of when you wouldn't want to be able to take that, when you wouldn't want to take that particular medication. Um, methotrexate is used also as anti-cancer. Um, and a lot of different kind of things. Um, like ectopic pregnancy treatment. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if it's going to treat ectopic pregnancy, right? Because that was in our list, right? That's one that crosses over into categories. Um, when would you not want to give it? What woman potentially would you not want to have taking methotrexate? Pregnant woman. Yeah, good, Danielle. Pregnant woman. Um. Let me try, let's see, okay. Um, ah, sorry. So if you have something, I guess I'll just ask the question. Does everybody know what Crohn's disease is? Yeah, it's like uh, intestines are kind of like stones, like they're pretty, and they have often like diarrhea. Right, it's one of the ones, to... right, where you need to know where to go to the bathroom. Like I need to know where the bathroom is because I might have to go. Um, and so if we're giving an anti-inflammatory, how do we know it's effective if we have diarrhea all the time? Hmm. If we have diarrhea all the time, we give the medication, how do we know it worked? You don't have yeah. diarrhea as often? <laughs> yeah. Good, Maria. <laughs> Maria L. And, and that's as easy as that. Um, do, do, do. Uh, okay. So the other thing about monoclonal antibodies is that there is, um, here's that nomenclature word, Sam, um, is to how they come up with the name, right? And so in your book, it will tell you somewhere, um, there's a, or I mean, let's see, um, or I can post the table that tells you what each specific part is for. And so what it tells you is like the, the first couple letters are usually like it's unique, whatever that particular, like infliximab, 
um, the, the Remicade. So the um, INF is just like its unique identifier. And then the LI part of it um, means that it's an immune modulator. So we're dealing with the immune system. And then um, let's see, inflix M, let's see, in, inf, le, the XI part means that it's actually, the, the XI is a, um, a hybrid, like a, um, I wanna say like a human and a rat or something. Like that's where they're getting the antibody from. Um, and so, and then the MAB is for monoclonal antibody. So um, I'll put the table up. I'm pretty sure it's in your, in your book as well that tells you how to break those down. And so you're going to need to know how to um, how to do that because if if you know it's a monoclonal antibody, you got the MAB, and if you know the first two or three letters are telling you that it's that unique drug, then really all you need to know is the um, the middle pieces, the LI, the XI, the ZU, those different ones. Um, okay, and. Let's see, and I still have to write, I haven't written the Discovy question yet, but there'll be something about that that you'll know. Does anything sound like it's really tripping people up yet or does it sound like this is doable? The monoclonal antibody has me kind of messed up. <laughs> okay, that's okay. So remember you have next week, if you guys have questions, right? Let me know. Um, Okay, moving on to, so the neuro stuff, the week 12 stuff, that's a lot of the stuff we talked about in class today, right? And so you have five questions on the, um, the anti-seizure meds. One, two, there's four meds, so that means you'll probably get two questions about the same medication. Um, so you need to know, for example, for um, Dilantin, which is phenytoin, you need to know um, side effects for that. Um, and you need to know about dosing for that, um, and dosing specific to children. And that's in your book. You'll be able to find that in your book. Um, and then your magnesium sulfate comes into play, right? Because if you have preeclampsia, you're at risk for starts seizures. with an S, has it seizures, thank you, right? And so this is where the mag sulfate, I think it was Maria was asking, do we have to know mag sulfate? This is the other place where it comes, right? And so how do you know, um, what are ways that you know that the medication is being effective? That was not a question. What are ways you know that mag sulfate is being effective? Um, doo, doo, doo. so things that you need to know about, um, carbamazepine or Tegretol, um, again, remember that we're trying to tie some of this stuff back into pregnancy. I don't think people realize really a lot of these things can go back, uh, um, into, uh, talking about pregnancy and conception and that kind of thing. But what are side effects of Tegretol or when would you not want to, um, give Tegretol, Tegretol uh, what I wanna say. Cause you have, there are choices of anti-seizure medications, but there are some times when you would not wanna give Tegretol and you'd wanna give other ones. If you're breastfeeding. Not necessarily. Okay. If you're pregnant, you don't care. There we go. Yeah. Oh, hi, Kim. Yeah. If you're, if you're pregnant, there's other cho better choices that can be. Um, Cause if you look up a lot of these medications, they're teratogenic, they have teratogenic effects. Um, okay. We are almost there. Let's see. So um, for the um, valproic acid, uh, the Depakote or uh, Depakine, um, you need to know, um, again, when you wouldn't give it, what would be in somebody's medical history that the nurse would be like, ooh, don't think they should be, um, don't think we should be giving this to them. And that has to do with kind of um, the pharmacokinetics. 
Um, GI issues. Hmm. Um, yeah, but something even more than that. I'm not actually putting that out as a question, GI issues, but there's something that's even would be more important than that if they have a history of some, something. Kidney, kidney Heart issues? Because it, it retains, it can retain fluid. I wasn't putting it out as a question. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. So yes, yes and yes, but there's even still some, don't answer, there's even something even more than GI and what I hear, kidney. So again, that, that's also in your um, question. Um, doo -doo -doo. If you are giving uh, phenobarb, phenobarbital, what are the side effects that you are um, looking for? Like, what would you be monitoring for? Not a question. Um, okay, and I will put up, I don't have the information, I don't think up again, but I will put up information for the, um, the ADHD meds. So you've got Ritalin and Adderall. And so um, what, does anybody know like the mechanism of action or like um, what the ADHD, these types of ADHD, the, um, sorry, Ritalin and Adderall are? I know that, well, both of them are stimulants. And mm -hmm. I believe Adderall, I, I'm not 100%, but I believe Adderall like basically dumps a bunch of dopamine into the brain. Um, it's an amphetamine. So they both come like from the amphetamine class. Um, and so what you want to think about, I honestly don't know the specifics if it has to do with dopamine. I didn't think it did, but it might. Um, I always think of it in terms more of being an amphetamine. And what do you see if somebody's on um, taking amphetamines? That's a question. Hyperactivity. They're hyperactive, right? So why does it work for somebody that has ADHD? It's the opposite. Yeah, it, hel it helps counteract it. Focus. So so if somebody's going to, if you're going to provide education um, to parents about Adderall or Ritalin, what um, what types of medications would you not want them to take, just in general, not like specific medications, um, if they're taking an amphetamine, they're taking Adderall or Ritalin. If we're giving them something that's going to make them... Um, that, that something that's an amphetamine that's going to make them hyper, not, not going to make them hyper, but that's what the medication does is make you hyper. What kind of medications like over the counter stuff would you not want them to take? Some sedatives or something that's going to, no? Not the stimulants. sedatives, the stimulants. Stimulants. Okay. Like so. caffeine or something? Yes. Yeah, caffeine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then let's see. Okay, and then, so uh, the last three, um, again, these actually tell you, um, like for the Cinemet, for the Carbidova Lebidopa, um, and these are, these three meds I chose because you'll see these, like we saw these in long-term care, the Cinemet, um, and you're gonna see them as you move into third semester as well. Um, so when you're talking about Parkinson's disease, um, that is a decrease in dopamine. And so how do we get dopamine into the brain to counteract that? Well, we would give levodopa because levodopa, the component of dopamine can cross uh, the blood brain barrier to get in and, and um, increase the dopamine, right? So that's one way, like an agonist, right? That's gonna increase, right? The carbidopa piece of cinnamon is an antagonist. It's going to, um, help keep the, um, the dopamine in the system. So what normally happens is you have the dopamine and the levodopa and that just keeps crossing over and everything's good. We have a lot of dopamine and we all feel great. But that's because at the same time, the, um, the carbidopa is also 
um, I just lost my train of thought. I hate getting old. Um, it, so the carbidopa piece, um, or I'm sorry, there is an inhibitor that also breaks down the dopamine. The carbidopa stops it from doing that. So the levodopa is the dopamine replacement and the carbidopa stops the thing that breaks it, the dopamine down, stops it from breaking down. So you would then have more dopamine that's able to cross over, to cross the traveling into the brain. So one's increasing it and one's stopping the thing that gets rid of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so when you combine it, then a lot more dopamine can cross into the brain. And so um, basically what you need to know for that um, is basically what I just told you. <laughs> um, baclofen, right? We, uh, we're gonna talk about spinal cord injury next week, but baclofen um, for cerebral palsy or um, spinal cord injury, it's like a muscle relaxant, <clears throat> excuse me. And so um, people that are very spastic, right? We talked about um, a little bit, it doesn't really have to do because that's brain stuff. But like if, you're, if your muscles are really rigid and you give a muscle relaxant like baclofen, especially with like cerebral palsy, um, children that aren't really able to move their muscles much at all. Like I know this one girl when I was working at Shriners, like she was, um, you know, she had like not contractures, but she just was very spastic. Like she couldn't really relax her muscles at all. She went horseback riding after she got a baclofen pump. So she, we had a pump that, that would pump the baclofen like on go, like an insulin pump, right? Only baclofen. So she was constantly getting just enough muscle relaxant to keep her muscles where she could move them. And like, she went horseback riding. Like I couldn't believe it when I heard that. I thought that was just like a miracle. Um, and so if it's a muscle relaxant, um, what does it tell you here that you need to monitor for um, adverse effects of that? And so if it's a muscle relaxant, what, um, what are you on alert for? And that was a question. Yeah, respiratory, it's always respiratory. Yeah. Um, good, and we did that one. And then, um, so Aricept is one of the medications that we use for um, Dinepazil, that's the other name, Dinepazil or Aricept is one of the medications that we use for um, Alzheimer's. Namenda is another one, that's an NMDA, um, but I'm having, I see the Dinepazil more often. Um, and so you need to know why we use it and how you know that it's working. You also need to understand that the medications for Alzheimer's don't cure it, right? So they only help with um, the acetylcholine levels in, in that way. Um, and, and as well as with the NMDA, it's not acetylcholine, it's a different neurotransmitter, but they just kind of help keep, hopefully keep it where it's at and not um, progress the disease to progress any farther. Does that make sense? Maybe? Yes. Yes, thank you. Okay, and finally, last but not least, four, which is what I think we all need right now, anti-anxiety medications, right? Do we need some of these? We yeah, have, these are our PAMs, right? So we've got the, um, the <laughs> lorazepam and the um, alprazolam, the Ativan and the Xanax, right? And so um, you need to know, well, you need, why you're taking them and then what are the side effects? Like if you're gonna take Ativan, what should you not be doing? Um, driving. Um, yeah, driving, you know, driving a tractor, lifting heavy machinery. <laughs> um, and um, any adverse effects or side effects, you would need to know those as well. And then um, Ambien is actually a sleep medication. Um, and you need to know the, um, like the onset, the, um, like the onset of the effectiveness of the medication. 
Like, am I going to take it? When am I going to take it before I go to bed? That's not a question. That's to look up, um, you know, what education are you going to provide to the client about when they should, how they should take the medication, the sleep medication. And then, what is that? Ramazacon, flumazamil. Um, So basically you need to know um, what flumazenil is, rumazicon, what that is, what's its mechanism of an action, mecha oh my goodness, mechanism of action and why do, why do we give it? And again, that's not a question. You can, you can look that up. That's all in my question. I think that we covered it all. Yes, no, maybe. Can we go back to one of the immunomodulators, something in that section? No. Of course, yeah, just a second. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I'm, I'm joking. I'm, t I'm too tired to, like, I know you all are tired. So what's, the qu what's your question? Um, I'm not sure we talked about tro... I don't know how to pronounce that one. No, trogarzo. Um, we did in an indirect way. Okay. I'll ask somebody for their notes or I'll rewatch the video. Okay. Any other questions? Anything about Xanax? I don't know if I missed it. Uh, so we have Ativan, Ambien. Ramazic. Um, the same, the yeah, the like the Xanax, the same. It's the same kind of thing. They're yeah, okay. They have the same mechani mechanism of actions, kind of the same, you know, teaching that you would do. Okay. Oh, I didn't look in the chat. I'm so sorry. Oh, Ambien. Oh, yeah. Ambien is the same as Zolpidem. Zolpidem tartrate. Yep. Are there any other questions? Let's go to bed. Yes, I think so. I think we're just, I have almost, a we're just at the hour. So there you go. Hey, sorry, you can listen to this and fall asleep. Who needs the Ambien? <laughs> <laughs> This is Soldier. Yes. Um, you guys can leave if you're done. I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, am I sure? Yes.